story that isn't just made for TV. Game of Thrones co-stars Kit Harrington and Rose Leslie, Jon Snow and Egret have tied the knot. The lovers, who were a couple on the show, as you know, saying, I do in Scotland. They announced their engagement back in September. Uh, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations, guys. That's just great. John Scott, Fox Report, next. Protests and rallies held across the country as the battle over immigration reaches a boiling point amid growing confusion over President Trump's executive order ending family separation at the border. Good evening, I'm John Scott. This is the Fox Report. With House Republicans planning to vote on a compromise immigration bill next week, President Trump repeating his call for the GOP to hold off tackling the polarizing issue until after the November midterms. Those remarks during the president's keynote address at the Nevada GOP convention in Las Vegas. Our people are actually doing a very good job handling a very difficult situation, but this is a problem that should have been solved years ago. So we're working very hard. The fact is we need more Republicans because the Democrats are obstructionists. They won't vote. They're total obstructionists. They don't want to vote. Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, they just want they want to use the issue. For their part, Democrats are putting the blame back on President Trump, lashing out at his border policies as they tour the immigrant detention centers now at the heart of this contentious debate. People who are seeking asylum um, should be given the rights of all those who um, are asylum seekers. It's the law of this country. This is part of this uh, Trump administration zero tolerance policy, which to me is barbaric. He can take care of this problem immediately. He created it. He can take care of it. We have Fox team coverage. Dan Springer is in Las Vegas and Garrett Tenney is standing by in our Washington bureau. But we begin with Steve Harrigan in McAllen, Texas. Steve, things uh, got a little heated there for a few moments today. They did, John. 96 degrees here and with about 200 protesters out here for much of the day, things did get heated. About a few hours ago, there were 200 protesters who surrounded a bus filled with parents and children. Those parents and children were being moved from one detention center to another together. They were not being separated, but that's not what the protesters thought. They surrounded the bus. One woman actually threw herself in front of the bus, but was dragged off by colleagues. They were shouting, free the children, free the children, despite the fact that separations were not underway. That was the perception. So some hot tempers here. And in the meantime, customs officials have put up metal barricades around their building for more buses to come down the line, John. And Democrats are keeping the spotlight on this issue with another visit. There have been visits from both political parties all week here in the Rio Grande Valley. We saw the two Texas Republican senators yesterday, but today it was Democrats, more than 20 Democratic lawmakers touring facilities for a first-hand look at the conditions. And when they came out before the microphones, many not happy with what they saw inside. Here's one. And fortunately, we weren't able to take our phones into these facilities because if we could have, he would have seen the photos of children in great pain in mothers clenching their children, fearful they were going to lose them, mothers sobbing um, in line in a detention facility. Health and Human Services officials now saying they're throwing all resources possible to try and make those reunifications of parents and children as quick as possible, saying emergency response team, the kind of teams used in the wake of hurricanes, will now be used to try and bring these children and parents together as quickly as possible. John? Steve Harrigan in McAllen, Texas. Steve, thank you. As we mentioned, President Trump visiting Las Vegas today amid the heated argument over his administration's handling of immigration. The president holding a round table on the Republican tax cuts with business and political leaders. Before landing, the president tweeted, heading to Nevada to talk trade and immigration with supporters. Country's economy is stronger than ever before with numbers that are getting better by the week. Tremendous potential and trade deals are coming along. Dan Springer is live with more from Las Vegas. Dan. 
Yeah, hi, John. President Trump spent a lot of time in today's speech talking about what he considers his accomplishments since taking office. He highlighted the fact that there's been massive uh, cuts in government regulations, uh, opening Anwar in Alaska to oil drilling, and getting the remains of 200 soldiers killed during the Korean War returned to the U.S. But he spoke the most about the economy, and that was also the topic at the roundtable discussion on tax reform that followed his keynote speech. Trump credits the tax cuts for creating 3.4 million jobs since he was sworn in. The other big topic was trade, and he tried to downplay any fears that the country will be hurt by a trade war. Well, a lot of things are happening. The trade stuff is coming along, just starting. Uh, but it's going to happen uh, because, you know, we're the piggy bank that everybody likes to rob from, they like to steal from. And unfortunately, and we have great allies, great friends, we protect them for a very small cost. And Trump says that his tariff on steel really has worked, and he just got word that there's going to be a $500 million investment in a brand new steel mill in the U.S. very shortly. John? And it sounds like uh, President Trump is thinking about keeping his majorities in Congress after all of this. Oh, yes. Uh, you can tell in almost every speech he gives, and a lot of his tweets are now focused very clearly on those midterm elections. He wants to keep those majorities. Uh, to that end, he campaigned today for Republican Senator Dean Heller, who was expected to be in a very hard fight to keep his job. Heller welcomed the president's support and says the tax cut has also helped Nevada lead the nation in job growth. His opponent is Jackie Rosen, who was elected to Congress two years ago. She is a former computer programmer, but today she was in the president's crosshairs. She wants to raise taxes. And I think somebody said she's in Nevada right now campaigning with Pocahontas. Yeah, and uh, the other comment that he made today about uh, his, what he calls Pocahontas, he said that, uh, can you believe that Jackie Rosen is campaigning as we speak up in northern um, Nevada with Elizabeth Warren? So uh, big day in politics here in Nevada. John? Dan Springer in Vegas. Dan, thank you. Well, despite President Trump expressing pessimism, House Republicans are moving forward with what's being touted as a compromise immigration bill next week. The legislation faces an uphill battle, to say the least. There's some very serious problems in there, uh, in that bill. Uh, it doesn't really deal with the underlying issues that present themselves here at the border. Uh, we know that we have to have a rational immigration program. People want to come to America to improve their lives. I think we'll have a vote next week, and hopefully we'll, we'll get together. But the Democrats, what have they put forward? Uh, for the last eight, nine years, they haven't done anything. It's time for us to do something as a party and to put aside differences. Garrett Tenney has the latest for us from Washington. So what are the Democrats saying about this bill, Garrett? Well, John, House Republicans put this bill together without any input from Democrats, and their hope is to be able to pass it without needing any Democratic votes as well. So the minority party has no plans to support this bill, and they argue that while it looks and sounds good in bullet point form, it doesn't address immigration issues in the right way. It deals in part with this policy that the president put in, the zero tolerance policy, but it doesn't really go to the heart of the matter. And it doesn't, excuse me, it doesn't deal with the DACA issue in any rational way at all. Yeah, it's important to remember, even if Republicans are able to pass this bill on their own in the House, they will need at least some Democratic support in the Senate, which is not going to come easily, John. Uh, and what are, what are the Republican leaders doing to try to get this thing passed? Well, we've been told that they are meeting with various factions of the Republican conference over this weekend, trying to come up with changes to the bill that will help it pass. And one change that we've been told about is the addition of a requirement for employers to use E-Verify to check the legal status of their workers. And that is targeted to win over conservative lawmakers who backed off the bill a bit this uh, late this week when the president seemed to suggest that he wasn't completely behind it. Tweeting Friday, in part, Republicans should stop wasting their time on immigration until after after we elect more senators and congressmen and women in November. It, he repeated that message again this afternoon in Las Vegas. This is a problem that should have been solved years ago. So we're working very hard. The fact is we need more Republicans because the Democrats are obstructionists. They won't vote. They're total obstructionists. They don't want to vote. Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, they just want 
They want to use the issue. And despite that, House GOP leadership says they are not giving up and are hopeful they'll be able to get an immigration bill passed next week. John? Garrett Tenney. Garrett, thank you. For more on all this, let's bring in Axios reporter Erica Pandy. Erica, the, the politics of this so interesting. The president clearly thinks uh, that this immigration argument is going to benefit Republicans when they, when they come to the polls in uh, November. Democrats also think that they have the winning argument. I don't know, you're a reporter and maybe you can't gaze into your crystal ball, but is it possible um, to, to predict which side is right here? I mean, I don't think it's possible to predict which side is right, but I mean, the, the interest from both sides has definitely spiked up. Axios put a poll in the field last week that shows that Demo the share of Democrats who think that immigration is the most important political issue right now has spiked to 18 percent. That's almost on par with the 21 percent of Republicans who think so. So it, there, I mean, there's no telling right now who is right, but it, this could gear up to be a political game changer ahead of November. Republicans basically voted down the, the Goodlatte bill. That's the more conservative com um, immigration bill that was presented this week. Week. This next one has this e-verify um, uh, proposal in it. It shoots down family immigration and, and a couple of other things. What is it that is in this bill that that would not gain the support of all Republicans enough to pass? Yeah, well, the red line for Republicans in this bill is a path to citizenship for DACA recipients. That was not in the Goodlatte bill. That is in this bill. And, you know, the more conservative uh, factions of the House see this basically as amnesty. And that is why, you know, it, it's unlikely that it will pass the House. And even if it does pass the House, it's dead on arrival in the Senate because the red line for Democrats is funding for the border wall. They're, they have nothing to gain politically by attaching their names to funding for the border wall. So, I mean, there's the red line for conservatives and the red line for Democrats, and even by adding E-Verify, and I think it's been reported that uh, uh, there was a provision for agricultural work visas added to, to garner conservative support. Even with those additions, you can't erase those two red lines. So even if this thing passes the House, it's never going to reach the president's desk. Exactly. And the president has said he's, he's thrown his support behind the bill, but he said, let's wait uh, and see if more Republicans are elected because he knows that you need more Republican presence in the Senate to get past that filibuster because as it stands, it's dead on arrival there. And, and that brings us back to the to the politics of all this. Uh, you know, some of the some of the things in the compromise bill, legal status for the the, uh, the so-called dreamers. Um, I guess the question is specifically how would that, you know, be put into be put into the bill? Uh, there are a lot of people who think that that the dreamers can't cut in line in front of those who have, you know, bided their time and, and waited through the process legally. Right. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. This reminds me exactly of what we saw in March. I mean, nothing has changed. There's still a lot of debate. Uh, Democrats want a clean path to citizenship for dreamers. Republicans oppose that, and Democrats aren't happy with even what's in the bill. They say, um, you know, as Garrett said, that it's it's too complicated a path, and it needs to be even cleaner. So there's just you know two polar opposites that it seems very unlikely that there will be a compromise, just as it did in March. The House Majority Whip Steve Scalise was on Fox and Friends this morning talking about all of this, and and clearly, uh, the politics of it is resonating in the House as well. Listen. We did fund over 100 miles of new border wall money this year. President Trump's actually bragged about the fact that he is building some wall. We, we want to get him the full amount. There's going to be another vote opportunity next week, so let's not give up hope yet. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to keep working at this. Uh, let's go and find a few more Senate seats and come back at it, at it again next year. Uh, so he seems to think that, that there will be, uh, that Republicans will be rewarded at the polls as a result of, of this argument. Exactly. I mean, he, he said that, you know, and Paul Ryan also said, Speaker Ryan also said, you know, we'll cross that bridge once we get to it uh, uh, when, when asked what happens if these two bills don't pass. But I think, I mean, if the, these two bills don't pass, it could be a, a, a hot political issue for Republican voters who could be frustrated seeing that nothing can be done by a GOP-controlled Congress and Republican president on immigration reform. This bill would get rid of the diversity lottery uh, system, right? And, and Republicans are all about killing that off. Do Democrats love that system? 
We, I mean, right when President Trump first announced uh, that he opposed the diversity lottery system, we saw a little bit of reaction from Democrats. But this migrant crisis has completely clouded that out. Mm. Um, it doesn't seem to be one of the more controversial parts of this bill, especially because it does award those uh, visas to a merit-based program. Erica Pandy, who covers Congress for Axios. Erica, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, Republican South Carolina congressional candidate Katie Arrington hospitalized right now with serious injuries after a head-on collision with a wrong-way driver. Arrington's campaign says she suffered a back fracture and several broken ribs. She's already had surgery, and her doctors say she will need more. The driver of the other vehicle died at the scene. Arrington likely will remain hospitalized for at least the next two weeks. The president offering his support, tweeting, My thoughts and prayers are with Representative Katie Arrington of South Carolina, including all of those involved in last night's car accident and their families. Right now, hundreds take to the streets for a fourth straight day, calling for justice after Pittsburgh police fatally shoot an unarmed teen. Plus, the European Union strikes back, slapping tariffs on a host of American-made goods in response to President Trump's trade actions. You're going to start to see that not only through higher consumer prices, um, but also as the companies are making these products that they're going to continue to make, you know, the automobile producers, they're going to have to do other things to try to keep their costs down. And so I think it may ultimately impact workers as well. Protesters take to the streets for the fourth straight day in Pittsburgh over the fatal police shooting of a teenager who turned out to be unarmed. The marchers want charges filed against the officer who shot 17-year-old Antoine Rose Jr. The incident unfolded during a traffic stop Tuesday night. The officer pulled Rose over because his car matched the description of a vehicle wanted in a shooting. Video shows that officer opening fire after Rose tried to run. In a fresh attack on President Trump's trade policies, the European Union is fighting back, slapping retaliatory tariffs on more than $3 billion worth of American-made goods. But trade experts say China was the country in President Trump's sights during his campaign. Most of the tariffs that the Trump administration has put on so far are on economic allies, Canada, Europe, Japan, uh, and not on China. And those are the countries that you want to have working with you on dealing with the fundamental underlying problems that we have out there in the mm -hmm. world, which, which potentially is China. But right now, they're not willing to. They're not able to politically. And in fact, they're being forced to retaliate against the United States, okay. impose their own tariffs on U.S. exports. Jillian Turner has more. The European Union's announced a 25% tariff on major American goods such as steel, bourbon, blue jeans, and motorbikes, all totaling about $3.4 billion. The EU claims the move is retaliation for the Trump administration's decision earlier this month to tax European steel and aluminum exports. The president tweeting his displeasure yesterday. He says, based on the tariffs and trade barriers long placed on the U.S. and its great companies and workers by the EU, if these tariffs and barriers are not soon broken down and removed, we will be placing a 20% tariff on all of their cars coming into the U.S. Build them here. The president's long insisted that in the system of global trade, the U.S. gets the short end of the stick, even making ending so-called bad deals with North American, Asian, and European allies a centerpiece of his campaign. This should have been taken care of a long time before my administration came into being. But for some reason, for 25, 30 years, nobody ever looked at trade deals. But the Commerce Secretary adopting a more diplomatic tone this week. We had tried very hard to have good negotiations before the steel and aluminum tariffs were put on. The president's critics in the Senate say the administration should have tried even harder before imposing a new tariffs regime on longtime allies. The administration's trade moves seem more like knee-jerk impulses than any kind of carefully thought-out strategy. Its most obvious accomplishment on trade so far is sowing a lot of chaos. The administration's moving full speed ahead with its take no prisoners approach on trade. Secretary Ross is in the midst of a review of automobile imports and is expected to announce new policies later this summer. And in just two weeks, the U.S. will begin taxing $34 billion of goods from China. In Washington, Jillian Turner, Fox News. And if those new tariffs on American-made bourbon are not bad enough, 
Half of the bourbon barrels aging at a Kentucky distillery came crashing to the ground yesterday when part of a warehouse collapsed. Nearly 10,000 barrels destroyed. The Bardstown, Kentucky police chief says no one was inside at the time, but he says the rest of the building is unstable and could collapse at any moment. News of the accident was met with concern on Twitter with bourbon lovers mourning the loss of all that wasted whiskey. With the country in the throes of a heated debate on immigration, we'll hear from people who have fled their home countries to seek asylum here in the U.S., how they're reacting to the situation at the border. Plus, new reaction from the Trump administration as it responds to the outcry over family separations. This as we get an update on how many of those children have been reunited with their parents. If you look at the polling, most people would say what I've said. Uh, it's, we shouldn't separate these families. The, the president uh, it corrected that, and he did so. Uh, you know, he made that decision on his own. He wasn't pushed into that decision. He, re he saw the numbers, and he made the decision. I'm John Scott, and this is the Fox Report. It's the bottom of the hour, and if you're just joining us, President Trump lashes out at Democrats during his keynote address at the Nevada GOP convention in Las Vegas, blaming them for the current crisis at the border. Now, as Democrats begin touring immigrant shelters across the nation, the president accuses them of trying to use immigration for their benefit ahead of the November midterms. Immigration? It's the Democrats' fault. We won't get one vote. I'm telling you, if we gave them every single thing they want, they will say we don't want it. It's pure obstruction. Remember their word, resist. Allison Barber has more from the White House. President Trump says Democrats are pushing phony stories of sadness and grief. On Friday, he focused on the stories of families who have lost a loved one in crimes committed by undocumented immigrants. The president says these families, who he calls angel families, do not get enough attention. No major network sent cameras to their homes or display the images of their incredible loved ones across the nightly news. They don't do that. They don't talk about the death and destruction caused by people that shouldn't be here. People that will continuously get into trouble and do bad things. He was 30 years old. I couldn't protect him because an illegal alien from Guatemala with two felonies, one deportation, two DUIs, he was protected. Riverside, California, sanctuary. I wear his ashes in a locket. This is how I get to hug my son. Critics say the president is using a broad brush and unfairly painting undocumented immigrants as violent criminals when the data doesn't seem to support it. Protesters greeted two administration officials at restaurants this week. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen was at a Mexican restaurant in D.C. when protesters flooded in, expressing their disapproval of the administration's immigration policies. Protesters also showed up at her house. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders says she was asked to leave a restaurant in Lexington, Virginia, Friday night because she works for President Trump. Officials say 2,300 children have been separated from their parents at the U.S.-Mexico border since the administration's zero-tolerance policy began in May. A senior administration official tells Fox News that 500 children have been reunited with their families after being separated at the southern border. They say those children and their parents were separated for, on average, three days. No word exactly on when or how the other 1,800 will be reunited with their families. The executive order President Trump signed on Wednesday did not include details about the reunification process. Reporting at the White House, I'm Ellison Barber, Fox News. The emotionally charged debate over immigration raged in all media this week, especially social media. Brian Yenis has a look at that for us now. Brian? Hi, John. Well, look, the fact is when you take an already emotional situation and you add children into that debate, emotions are going to run extremely high. And the newest edition of Time magazine, well, the cover has added more fuel to the fire. It shows a Honduran two-year-old girl named Yanella crying as President Trump is depicted towering over and looking down at the toddler. The cover reads, Welcome to America. The little girl was cropped from a Getty's image photo, which shows the girl crying as her mother is searched 
approached by a Border Patrol agent. Now, Time magazine in its article said that after the photo was taken, the girl was separated from her mother. That's not true. Turns out the mother and her daughter were never split up and are still together. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders says this image is misleading, tweeting, quote, it's shameful that Dems and the media exploited this photo of a little girl to push their agenda. She was not separated from her mom. The separation here is from the facts. Dems should join POTUS and fix our broken immigration system. Hashtag change the laws. Time magazine added a correction to the original story, but the publication says it still stands stands by its cover. They say it captures the truth of the administration's child separation policy. And in a statement, Times said in part, quote, the June 12th photograph of the two-year-old Honduran girl became the most visible symbol of the ongoing immigration debate in America for a reason. Our cover and our reporting capture the stakes of this moment. The little girl's father, well, he says this about his daughter, about her, he thinks that his daughter is actually bringing about change. I think my daughter's situation will touch someone's heart. Yes, maybe the President of the United States, the migration authorities there. Because of her picture, the route for migrants in the United States has changed. And John, meanwhile, views on immigration have gotten some people in trouble this week. This is Alabama country musician Philip McCain. He apologized after he was fired from his band and received death threats for posting a Facebook status in which he said he would, quote, volunteer to shoot people when they approach the border. And Texas Tech University is investigating similar posts by students at their school. John. Such a controversial question. Yes, it is. Brian Yannis, thank you. Of course. Meanwhile, the crisis at the border appears to have some families seeking asylum, reconsidering their options. William Lajeunesse has more on that. I just found out yesterday, and if this is so, I'll just go back. I don't want to be separated from my kid. In Tijuana, Mexico, President Trump's immigration policy has immigrants guessing. A couple days before, I'll decide if I stay or go. I don't want to be separated from my kids. These women told our interpreter they did not want their faces shown for fear of retribution. When they fled violence at home weeks ago, they'd never heard of zero tolerance. Then these photos appeared on their phone of immigrant children behind a chain link fence. Say I have two kids, they'll take them away and they'll send them to a to America knowing you could lose your children? If it comes to the choice where I have to choose between my kids and crossing, I'll keep my kids. At the port of entry, immigrants from around the world line up to seek asylum. For many, it's a long wait. They lose patience and cross illegally. Fraud, say border agents, is not uncommon. It would be a group of five or seven that all had the same answers and nobody was related. And what does that tell us? Uh, to me, that tells me they're a coach. Most are economic migrants. They embellish stories of violence or persecution, hoping to qualify for asylum. It's up to an immigration judge to separate fact from fiction. So the men you see behind me are from Cameroon. They've been on the road for four months, but here in Tijuana for three weeks, waiting to ask for asylum. Someone wants to kill me. I don't believe that United States will allow someone to kill me. Across town, this shelter is filled with immigrants waiting to cross. This young man made the dangerous journey alone. Why would a parent allow that? Because the mother takes the children. Boys in Honduras, he says, have little choice when MS-13 comes calling. Police look for older people, but they don't look for children. The parents prefer them to travel alone than to stay in Honduras and be captured by the mother. William Lajeunesse. William, thank you. And you can hear much more on this topic tomorrow morning when House Homeland Security Committee Chairman Mike McCall appears exclusively on Fox News Sunday. It airs at 2 and 7 p.m. Eastern here on Fox News Channel. It also runs on your local Fox station. Check the TV listing if you want to catch it there. Anti-Brexit demonstrators descend on the streets of London. In a few years' time, if I'm not here and Brexit has gone pear-shaped and stuff like that, I'm going to sit back and think, what was I doing? What was I doing to actually help? So that's what I'm here to do. We have the latest from London as pro-European Union protesters call for a new vote. Plus, severe weather threatening parts of the country. Adam Klotz in the Fox News Extreme Weather Center tells us what to expect. And here's what's coming up on Waters World. We run down the major media lies of the week. An outer space lady is here, and yours truly went back out and hit the streets. 
Tonight, the U.S. military is preparing for the return of American war remains from North Korea. Pyongyang agreed to send home the remains during the June 12th summit between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and President Trump. Today, 100 coffins arrived at the demilitarized zone between the Koreas. The coffins will be used to bring home the remains of American troops missing since the Korean War of 1950-53. to 53. President Trump says the move fulfills another campaign promise. When I was campaigning, people would come to me and, and with tears in their eyes, they'd say, would it be possible to get back the remains of our father? Would it be possible to get back the remains of family members? As we're negotiating different points the other day in Singapore, I asked Chairman Kim, would it be possible to do that? The last thing I asked, I said, do you mind? Because I have many people that have written and called and spoken to me. Would I be able to get the remains back of all those great heroes that we had from so many years ago? And he said, I will do that. While the military's preparations suggest the families of those fallen troops might finally get some answers soon, it's not clear tonight when the transfer will take place. At least one person is dead and more than 150 others hurt after an attack at a political rally in Ethiopia. The country's prime minister was addressing tens of thousands of people when witnesses say a man tried to throw a grenade at the stage. The device went off in the crowd instead. The prime minister called it a well-orchestrated attack and said police are investigating who's behind it. The bloodshed follows months of anti-government protests there. A Brexit march descends on London. Protesters out in force still angry two years after the UK voted to leave the European Union. These pro-EU demonstrators want a new vote as the issue continues to divide the British nation. Some say if the issue were put to the voters again, the outcome would be different. It's never too late to stand up for what you, what you believe in and argue passionately for the causes that you, that you care about. Brexit is a big deal in my view, not a done deal. It's going to affect this country for generations. Uh, the younger people in this country, many of whom will be out there marching today, are going to have to live with these decisions. The way things are going, I feel it's not going the right way. I'm sure there's many others that feel like I do. And many people who voted uh, leave, I think they were deceived and many of them will have changed their minds. Kitty Logan has more for us from London. Hi, John. Well, organisers say around 100,000 people turned out to call for a say on the final Brexit deal. They say they want a public vote once those terms are agreed. These demonstrators waving EU flags and banners are calling on the government to hold a public vote on the final Brexit deal. Most say they're not challenging if Brexit will happen, but how Britain leaves the EU. But two years on from the referendum vote, those details are still being hammered out. Once a deal is done, it will be subject to a vote in Parliament. Some here say they fear the country could be worse off if the government comes away with a bad deal, and they want to have a second referendum to have their say in it. But there are others amongst the crowd who don't want Brexit to happen at all. The issue of Brexit is as divisive now as it was two years ago. There was a smaller pro-Brexit demonstration in London on Saturday as well, but some Brexit supporters are also critical about the progress of negotiations and they're pressuring the government to take a tougher line. On Friday, Airbus said if Britain leaves the EU with no deal, it may consider relocating elsewhere. That could cost around 14,000 jobs. So two years ago, that referendum result was pretty close and many people still feel strongly opposed to Brexit. But the real issue now is how that process will unfold. And that remains unclear. John? Kitty Logan, thank you. We want to invite you to watch a very special hour-long program tomorrow night on Fox devoted to remembering our friend, colleague and conscience. Charles Krauthammer, one of the most influential political analysts of the modern era and a longtime favorite of our viewers. Krauthammer, you probably know, passed away Thursday at the age of 68 after valiantly battling cancer. Here's a clip where he explains what led to his life-changing injury. I see it like as if it happened in a film. It was the end of my first year of medical school. We're doing neurology. We're studying the spinal cord, of all things. My classmate and I decided to skip the morning session. Beautiful July day. We're gonna, and we play tennis instead. We get, and we're, we're now headed over to class for the second session. We're very sweaty, it's very hot, very beautiful day. 
So we drop in next door to the medical school to the Children's Inn. You know, those are the, the uh, hotels nearby for the parents of children. When my friend and I arrived at the pool, there were lots of people in it, swimming in it. We go for a swim, we take a few dives, and I hit my head on the bottom of the pool. The amazing thing is there was no cut on my head. It just hit at precisely the angle where all the force was transmitted to one spot, and that is the uh, cervical vertebra, which severed the spinal cord. I'd been studying neurology. I knew exactly what happened. I knew why I wasn't able to move and I knew what that meant. You can watch that special tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back. Florida pressing the Trump administration to help fix a levy system that experts say is causing major problems for the state's environment. Douglas Kennedy has that story. So this is uh, the area called, they call the crossroads. It's where the St. Lucie River, it's the Indian River. Mike Holliday has been fishing at the mouth of the St. Lucie River in Stewart, Florida for decades. A pastime he says is now threatened every time there's a big storm event. So you're basically seeing a lot of algae blooms and a lot of dead fish. What, what else are you seeing? Um, you know, like all the, all the marine species leave and then the water's so dirty, it's almost difficult to navigate. The problem, he says, is here at Lake Okeechobee in the center of South Florida. After a storm, water is trapped here at this dam and levee system, sending water east down the St. Lucie to the Atlantic Ocean. The system was designed 60 years ago to encourage development and keep South Florida dry. Unfortunately, it dried out a lot of the Everglade wetlands. Well, this is one of the primary outlets for Lake Okeechobee. And according to this man, system failures are affecting drinking water quality and availability from Miami to Palm Beach. So the levee system here is also in danger of failing, which could cause catastrophic flooding. Sure, this, uh, this lake has a history in the uh, late 1920s. It claimed 3,000 lives from the result of flooding associated with uh, two previous hurricanes. John Campbell is from the United States Army Corps of Engineers, which has a major infrastructure plan to fix the levee system and send the excess water south back to the Everglades rather than east to Stewart. So this is basically 68 different infrastructure projects made up of new canals and levees and all sorts of things. Right, so the, 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 the intent of the restoration plan is to keep the same level of flood risk reduction, keep that the same for the people that live and work in South Florida, while at the same time making the system more environmentally friendly. A plan that sounds just fine to Mike. So you want to see it return to the way God created it? it? You know, nature made a system that worked, and we've diverted the water uh, to the detriment of our estuaries. Return it to how it was. It worked. To return it to the way it was, the state of Florida has already pledged half of the $16 billion price tag. They say they're hoping to get the other half from the Trump administration. Near the St. Lucie in Southern Florida, Douglas Kennedy, Fox News. Meantime, parts of the plains and the mid-Atlantic could see large hail, flash flooding and tornadoes this weekend. Meteorologist Adam Klotz is tracking the path of this violent weather. He has more from the Fox Extreme Weather Center. Adam. Hey there, John. Yeah, it's going to be a really busy weekend, especially here as we get into Sunday for a lot of folks in the Plain States. This is the area we've been talking about, and you've actually seen a couple of rounds of showers move across the south already. The heavier rain, the bigger storms, that's going to be something we're targeting more for a later Sunday event as all these ingredients are kind of piling together. The big severe threat is kind of targeted there right across portions of Kansas. What are we concerned about? Well, large hail, damaging winds, possibly some flash flooding and some really heavy rain, and it's not unheard of to see some isolated tornadoes. Tornadoes. Uh, we're getting up to this moderate risk that is pretty high on this scale. You don't see that a lot. And when you do, you know that we're in store for potentially some pretty big weather that's going to be coming for you on Sunday evening. Here's how we can time that out for you in our hour by hour forecast. Pay attention to your timestamp up in the corner. Now there will be some rounds of potentially severe weather running across the south here overnight, but the system that could get real big, 
there it is kind of blowing up as you get later into Sunday. So you do need that daytime heating to really build up and then you start to see these individual cells fire up and any one of these could produce a really powerful punch as you're sweeping across the plains there again running through the overnight hours and that's when this can be the most dangerous when the sun is set and taking you all the way into your early Monday morning before this eventually winds down a little bit outside of these areas where we're talking about a potential for severe weather. There are some other spots across the country. Folks in the West continuing to see dry conditions, the desert Southwest, everything you're looking at here in the pink section and even portions of Northern California. Those are elevated fire danger areas as we're looking at low humidity. They haven't seen rain in a while and with that winds continue to whip 20, 30 miles an hour. And when you get those low dry conditions and those winds uh, really mixing up like that, you can see these wildfires spread very quickly. Something to pay attention to. Otherwise, across the country, fueling all this some very warm temperatures. Uh, these were today's highs. It's going to be even hotter for folks uh, on Sunday, John. And it's a lot of that heat that's going to be fueling some of those storms people are, go are going to want to pay attention to. Meteorologist Adam Klotz, thank you. Yep. yep. Well, most of us can only hope to be millionaires, but one teenager is living the dream thanks to her idea of putting a new twist on a candy classic. Her story straight ahead. Yes, baby.